Hi, welcome back to West Coast Geeks. I'm your host, Joaquin. How we doing, people? As you can see, the title of the video, it's Top 10 Cantrips for Wizard. We're starting out at first level. So you know who's with me, my boy, Greg. Hey, everyone. So, um, we're, we're actually going to be making a series of videos to help out new players and new DMs. And so we're starting out with... Um, top 10 lists that will help new players so for this one we're doing top 10 cantrips for wizards because in the starter set which is a video that will be coming out soon um, one of the pre-made characters is a wizard and so um, they pick the spells there for you but um, you can always switch them out all right so greg how long you've been playing D D? That's 2006 or so, probably. So you've been playing for a while. And for myself, yep. for those of you who don't know, I've been playing on and off since the age of eight, which puts me at 1980. So yeah, people, you can do the math. I'm old. So here we are, fifth edition. Got a top 10 list. Uh, Greg, in my campaign, usually plays a wizard. But right now, he's actually playing a paladin, so, but... Usually, did it once. Yep. So let's get on with this list, now that we've given our credentials. All right. Oops, come on. You're supposed to go. Oh, man. Oh, I didn't hit the begin the slideshow. From the beginning. All right, I gotta learn something here, people. All right, number 10. Press the dissertation. Cantrip. Casting time. One action. Range 10 feet. Components verbal. And uh, what's the S supposed to stand for? Semantic. Semantics. Yeah, so you're supposed to be moving your hands around. Duration. Yeah. One hour. School. Transmutation. Attack save. None. Damage effects. Utility. This spell is a minor magic trick that novice spell casters use for practice. You can create one of the following magical effects within range. You can create an instantaneously harmless sensory effect, such as a shower of sparks, a puff of wind, faint musical noises, or an odd odor. You can instantaneously light or snuff out a candle, a torch, or a small campfire. Ooh, scary. You instantaneously clean or soil an object no larger than one cubic foot. You can chill, warm, or flavor up to one cubic foot of non-living material for one hour. That can be pretty deadly, and Greg will tell you what kind of shenanigans you can do after I'm reading these last things. You can make a color, a small mark, or a symbol appear on an object or surface for one hour. You can create a non-magical trinket or an illusionary image that can fit in your hand and that lasts until the end of your turn. And then finally, if you cast this spell multiple times, you can have up to three of its non-instantaneous effects active at a time and you can dismiss them such as an effect as an action. So for up to one hour, you can do three different things. All right, Greg. What, yeah, I've been doing what, this wrong. So what do you like about this spell? Because I asked Greg to give me uh, a list of some of the uh, so, ca his favorite cantrips. And this was it, one of them. So do you see the uh, how the how all the options are? That means that it's versatile. Yep. It's very, very versatile. So being able to clean or soil things, that's just amazing. Um, the whole, like, putting fires on or off. So you don't need to worry about, like, tin... Uh, Flint and steel or something. Um, you can, you know, snuff out all the lights as you go down the hallway or turn them all on. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you can keep your beer cold. You can warm up your coffee. Uh, or, you know, cook your own soup in a cup. Uh, flavoring things is great because you can flavor things to whatever you want, like give people really bad pies and make them taste like good pies. That's always good. You can mask poisons. <laughs> yeah, mask poisons. Um, you have 
make colors or marks on people. So like we have like things written on their back, like I'm stupid or kick, kick, kick me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, whatever. Yeah, they won't know where it comes from. No, you could put on their thief, and as they're going through the market, people will be looking at them funny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so, on any surface, right? Yeah. So it's um, like color. it's been described as the best way to annoy uh, other player characters, or more importantly, the DM. <laughs> it's just like one of those things where you're just doing stupid things just to do it. You know, you like um. Like, sometimes they can be quick, you know. You could be in a campsite and you hear a noise and you're like, I snuff out the, the, the campfire, right? Instead of taking another action or getting over there, you just, you're just like, boom. Or you, can, or you can light it back up instantaneously. So, um, in, survival insta- in survival mode, it does not mention anything about weather. So, you know, unless you're in... Like the water plane, you wouldn't be able to use that. But anywhere else, no matter how cold it is on the prime material plane, you're going to be able to light that campfire. So there's yep. that, you know. Like, you know, there, there, yeah, there, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. It's, it, like you said, it's a utility. It's a nice spell. That's why it's number 10. Uh, also for a quick... Like, fun fact, uh, a wizard only gets three cantrips, and you don't get to swap these out. So, at first level, especially if you're new, um, it's kind of important to really look over and kind of decide what kind of spells you're going to need, depending on the campaign. So, when you have a session zero with your dungeon master, they usually are going to tell you they're going to, what areas they're going to be starting out. So that can help you at the beginning pick your spells. And the reason why I picked these 10 spells, and I asked Greg to give me uh, some list from him, because these are the spells that will work in most situations. They're not conditional. All right. Also great if you have like a bard friend or a thief that's good at like deception. Yep. You can help him like fake his death and do all sorts of other stuff. With like making spontaneous blood show up on his clothes, like he's been shot or something, or yeah, stabbed. So there's there's all kinds of things you can do. <coughs> Which at number nine is message, message, cantrip, one action, casting time, 120 feet range, verbal, somatic, and material. Now, um, I usually don't play with materials. I just tell the the player characters, every time they go into a village or a city or whatever, I let them know that unless they get like a spell focus, that they have to spend some uh, gold to buy material. And that should last them until they get to the next place. Because it's, it's just, you know, um, too much to keep track of or force them to keep track of. Duration, one round. School, transportation, attack save, none. Damage effect is communication, dot, dot, dot. You point your finger towards a creature within range and whisper a message. The target and only the target hears a message and re- can reply in a whisper that only you can hear. You cast a spell through solid objects if you are familiar with the target and you know it's beyond the barrier. Magical silence, one foot of stone, one inch of common metal, a thin sheet of lead, three feet of wood... Blocks the spell. It's like, what is this, Superman? <laughs> the shade of lead. The spell doesn't follow a straight line. It can travel freely around corners or through openings. So with this last part, I just think that's kind of weird because it's magic. Shouldn't it just go through all that stuff? Like whatever the range is, regardless of um, yeah, the material. You want to have a limit on stuff like that. I, then, then limit the range. Or, or a cantrip. I guess, you know, I, I just, I, just for me, I've always just thought that was kind of funny. Like, okay, but, um. Yeah, trip called message. It isn't located, I locate person. Yeah. So, Greg, yeah, what are it, the fun ways you've used message? Oh, this just helps you, like, if you're, you need to split the party for an ambush, you can communicate with the other half, or you can 
go to different errands throughout the town and as long as you're within your 120 foot range you can keep tabs on them or you can be the lookout while the all the faces trying to con some information out of someone yeah so it's a, right. it's a very handy spell you know so like i said this is number nine because you only get three to pick so you you really need to think about what um cantrips and i'm probably gonna be saying that through the entire video all right that brings us to number eight mold earth level cantrip one action 30 feet for the range is 30 feet or five feet area uh spell component Duration, instantaneous, transmutation, attack save, none, damage effect, control. You choose a, a portion of dirt or stone that you can see within range, excuse me, and fits within a five-foot cube. You manipulate it in one of the following ways. If the target an area of loose dirt, you can instantaneously excavate it, move along the ground, and deposit up to five feet away. This movement doesn't have enough force to cause damage. You can cause shape, colors, or both to appear in the dirt or stone, spelling out words, clean, creating images, or shaping uh, patterns. This changes for one hour. If the dirt or stone your target is on the ground, you can cause it to become difficult terrain. Alternatively, you can cause the ground to become normal terrain if it already is difficult terrain. This change lasts for one hour. If you cast this spell multiple times, you have no more than two of its non-instantaneous effects at a time, and you can dismiss such an effect as an action. So, as have you ever taken this cantrip? Nope. I mean, I'd, I'd say just buy a shovel. Yeah, you know, it's, uh... So... For those of you who used to who who have played like second edition or advanced Dungeons and Dragons and even three point three and three point five, there was a first level spell called Dig that was shenanigans. I mean, if you ever read what that spell did, it it dug a lot of earth really quick. So you know you could um, dig a big pit. And somebody's chasing you around the corner. And as soon as you go around that corner, you dig that pit. And then they go around chasing. And the odds are that they're not going to catch it in time. And they fall into that pit. You can use it to make trenches. There's all, there was all kinds of applications you could have done with this. This just seems like it can have some use. In The reason why I, I, I picked it for number eight was that you could use it to make a difficult terrain. So, um, most dungeons... Square. If the dirt or stone you're target on ground, you can cause it to become difficult terrain. Alternatively, you can cause the ground to become normal terrain if it's already difficult terrain. This change lasts for one hour. Just buy a shovel... And then when you come across the first goblin or kobold you come across... <laughs> you ain't got time for that. Just keep one of them alive, hand them the shovel, and say, you're our dig butt. Yeah. <laughs> and then keep them around and have them be used as your dig butt. So, it, it's an option. It's it's one of these spells you can be a little bit creative with. Um, you can uh, create images or shaping patterns. You know, it's... You could even use it to even... Looks like you can make... Mud pies. Oh, and sand castles. Yeah, doesn't like it. It doesn't even allow you to build like a little wall or anything. No. No. It's not great. So, you know, um, I guess in a sense that if you have enough time, you could just keep digging through a um a stone wall in theory. Hmm. <laughs> You could. Okay. Dig around, dig underneath it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, who knows? You can find some clever things to do with it. That's why I have it number eight. Number seven. 
Mage Hand. Cantrip, one action, 30 feet, verbal and spell components. Duration is one minute, so it does require con uh, concentration, uh, conjuring, conjuration, no attack save, uh, damage effect utility. A spectral floating hand appears at one point. You choose it within range. The hand lasts for a duration until you dismiss it as an action. The hand vanishes and moves more than 30 feet away from you, or you cast a spell again. You can use an action to control the hand. You can use the hand to manipulate an object, open or unlock doors or containers, stow or retrieve an item from an open container, or pour the contents out of a vial. You can move the hand up to 30 feet each time you use it. The hand cannot attack. It cannot activate magical items, nor can it carry more than 10 pounds. So, as you can see in the picture, that's stuff that probably Greg would use for it all the time. <laughs> Trying to grab oh, you, stuff out of people. You just open, like, the chest and thing. Anything that might be trapped, you open it with this thing 30 feet away. And so, it, if it, like, the whole thing explodes, it's going to explode 30 feet away from you, then right in your hand. Yep. That's basically what it's for. I mean, unless you're a thief wizard, yep. then you could use it for, like, pickpocketing from... Well, far away. You can also use the hand to use it for like a, to put your grappling hook. <laughs> we haven't you haven't seen that video yet, but if you uh, just throw it up there, yeah, the grappling the, the hand could just take the grappling hook and put it up there. Only thirty feet. You probably throw a grappling hook like fifty feet. Mm, I don't know. Those are, those are weird D and D rules that as a DM you're gonna have to like figure out. How far you can throw things that people are like, well, I throw my grappling hook. And you're like, what? How do I, how do I even calculate that? But that's another video. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do with it. A lot of shenanigans. Um, great numbers. That's why it's number seven. So, you know. Another one is a damage spell called Poison Spray. Um, its range is only 10 feet. So you are getting up close and personal. Duration is instantaneous, school conjuration. Attack is con save, uh, damage effect is poison. You extend your hand towards a creature you can see within range and project a puff of noxious gas from your palm. The creature must succeed on a constitution saving throw or take 1 to 12 poison damage. And the spell also uh, increases upon level. So when you hit like 5th level, that's 2d12. And it scales. What do you think of this? What do you think of Poison Spray? It's pretty good for what it does. But it all, the poison's not as good as it used to be. Yeah. It's the downside. I mean, so it's like it's better, but then it also gets... There's no... Poison used to be a really bad lasting effect. Yeah. And now it's kind of tame. Yeah, they have calmed it down. But here's the thing, it doesn't even say that they take that they're affected by poison. Oh, doesn't it? Oh. Uh -uh. Even worse. And I was uh, like, I mean, what? It's part of the reason why I kind of yeah, picked this. I mean one D twelve is good. Yep. The uh lack of range is not great. Just if you know you're going to be close, then go ahead, take it. Yeah, it's you know it's it's one of those spells that you can you can kind of float around. It depends on what kind of mage character you're going to be. And I'm just checking on that spell right now because I want to make sure that because I just pulled these off the site to um, you know create my little video here. So oh, is it really? It's a con save and then not, not even half damage or take yeah it either take it either you you if you uh fail this if you make the save you don't take any damage that's not so good oh. that's not so good i mean because con is the one thing that most a lot of creatures have, have. Lot of, but we are talking you know. like first level creatures so you know yeah but it's the one step that they have yeah that's why it's number six. Number five is light. So, um, casting time, one action, touch, 20 feet. 
verbal and material, school, evocation, attack save, dexterity save, creation. You touch an object that is larger, no larger than 20 feet in any di dimension. Until the spell ends, the object sheds bright light in a 20-foot radius and dim light for an additional 20 feet. The light can be colored as you like. Completely covering the object with something opaque blocks the light. Opaque blocks the light. The spell ends if you cast it again or dismiss it as an action. If you target an object held or worn by a hostile creature, that creature must succeed on a dex saving throw to avoid the spell. Cool. Well, I never thought about using it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're tr you're you're trying to blind him, I guess, for a second. No, not blind. It's just light. Yeah, but I mean. So if you have if you have like a creature that's like a um, that goes invisible or something. Like I guess the light wouldn't go invisible. Well, it depends. So, I don't know that that that's one of those iffy D D and D questions because. <sighs> The, I'm, I'm pretty sure the invisibility spell is everything that you carry. If they're invisible, how would you know what object to hit? You know. No, I mean, say that they're they are visible. Then you hit something on them with the spell. Then they go and then they try to go invisible again. Even though the, the object that is casting the light will be invisible, it's still casting the light, and you can kind of guess like where it's coming from, sort it's, of. It's a really good spell to hit on something that's running away in the forest or something. Yeah. And you want to be able to track it down. Most of the time, you don't use it for that. You're using it when you go into, um, you know, you're going into the dungeon, you're going into the cave. The, the wizard will usually light up his staff because he's towards the back or in the middle of the group. And now you've got some light. This is where your sack of ball bearings comes in handy because you take one ball bearing out of your bag, cast light on it, and throw it down, the, roll it down the hallway, and you can light up what's ahead of you. That's one away. Yeah, because then or you know you can always, as an action, just let it end. You can dismiss it. Number yeah, four. My last, my last character liked to put light on his crossbow bolts, so if we could a light while hitting a creature. Yeah, it's kind of fun. That was creative. Number four, probably one of Greg's uh, favorite cantrips, Minor Illusion, casting time, one action, 30 feet and five feet area. Um, spell, I mean, um, somatics and material, one minute, school's illusion, attack save, none, damage, effect control. You create a sound or an object, an image of an object within range that lasts for the duration. The illusion also ends if you dismiss it as an action or cast a spell again. If you create sound, its volume can change from whisper to a scream. It can be your voice, someone else's voice, a lion's roar, a beating of the drums, or any of the sound you choose. The sound continues unabated through the duration, or you can make it discrete sounds at different times before the spell ends. If you create an image of an object, such as a chair, muddy footprints, or a small chest, it, mean, it must be no larger than the five-foot cube. The image can't create sound, light, smell, or any other sensory effect. Physical interaction with the image reveals it to be an illusion because things can pass through it. If a creature uses an action to examine the sound or image, the creature can determine its illusion with an accessible, intelligent investigation check. Against your save, a DC, if the creature discerns the illusion for what it is, the illusion becomes faint to the creature. All right, Greg, so what do you use this for? Never taken this. You've so never I've... taken Minor Illusion? Nope, I usually take the silent image for the level one spell instead. Wow, I am shocked. So, I, I'm only saying this because, I, you know, uh, Greg and I have been playing D&D &D for like, I don't know, going on two years now, different campaigns, different groups. And the Wizards he plays, um, it, to me, this seems like this is right up his alley. He's always doing yeah. shenanigans and getting into somewhat trouble. So to, you know, turn Strong yourself into a, into a right. rock or, or or hide among a bunch of barrels. Yeah. You know. Um, stronger, stronger level one. I'm willing to take a spell slot for it because that. For something that does, you know, like a larger area. 
and can hide the whole party or can make a effect that's a larger distance just so it's stronger it's it's a very good effect i just i want more of it so that's why i take the level one version instead of using this as a cantrip because like you said you only get three cantrips yeah and this is usually because i'm taking the first level silent image spell i'm not taking this if you aren't going to take the silent image spell level one then i would probably take this yep that's why i listed it like in number four like um these are all different options and you know with the um Tasha's guide to everything and Xanatar's guide to everything. You know, there's a lot of other spells in there. And most of them are like damage spells. So, um, you know, it really depends on what kind of uh, wizard you want to be. Speaking of damage, number three is Toll the Dead. So this one comes from Xanatar's guide to everything. It's a necromancy cantrip. It's one action, 60 feet, verbal and sound components. Duration instantaneous. You point at one creature you can see within range, and the sound of uh, Dorlius. How do you pronounce that? Dolorius bells fill the air around it for a moment. The target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw. Take 1d8 necrotic damage. If the target is missing any of its hit points, it instead takes 1d12. And it just, you know, when you hit fifth level, it starts doing even more damage. So Greg, I know you take this. Oh no. So you're a wizard. So you're a wizard. Yeah, I take this. And this is my number one, by the way, to anyone out there. Yeah. Hey, this is the best one. So the first thing is you're almost always getting the one D twelve damage because you're you're a wizard. You're gonna go your dexterity is probably not very high, so you're not gonna go very fast in the initiative order. So let your party damage something first and then you can finish it off with the big one D twelve damage. Um, and then it's a wisdom save, which is a, the weakest uh, stat for most monsters in the monster manual. Have problems with wisdom, so it's a harder save for them to make. That it is. So I put it at number three only because the range is sixty feet. So you know when I hit when I give you my number one, I'll go into that more. But um. This is where Greg and I disagree on this, so moving on to number two. Dancing Lights. Um, Greg has always used this spell pretty efficient, so here we go. It's a cantrip, one action, 120 feet, verbal, sound, verbal, um, Mantis, semantics, sure. and material. So concentration, one minute, school, invocation, attack, none, damage, effect, utility, you're a creature up to four torch-sized lights within range, making them appear as torches, lanterns, or glowing orbs that hover the air for the duration. You can also combine the four lights into one glowing, vague, humanoid form of medium size. Whichever form you choose, each light sheds dim light to 10-foot radius. As a bonus action on your turn, you can move the lights up to 60 feet to a new spot within range. A light must be within 20 foot of another light created by the spell, and a light winks out if it exceeds the spell's range. Yeah, so just perfect. Yeah. Um, you're exploring a dungeon. You put a light in every direction so you don't get surprised. Yeah. It's, this is much better than, than the light spell. Yeah, that's why I put it at number two, because I was talking, and I was like, man, you should always take light. Like, light should be in the top five. No, the gray 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 dancing lights or light. One of the two is kind of almost necessary. Yeah. You should always take one of them, especially if you're playing, especially if yourself, if you're a human, or if at least one or two members of your party do not have infravision. And it just seems like D&D &D lately has been trying to make it to where everybody just sees in the dark. <laughs> so um you know so dancing light helps out a lot and the best effect of it is you just get to move it around so it doesn't really shed that much light so um as long as you're staying somewhat quiet most creatures may not notice you moving around in the dark all right here's my number one 
And uh, this is where Greg and I differ. Number one is Firebolt. It's a cantrip, one action, 120 feet, verbal, semantics, instantaneously, school invocation, range attack, does fire damage. You hurl a moat of fire at a creature or an object within range, make a range attack against the target on a hit. The target takes 1d10 fire damage. A flammable object hit by the spell ignites if it's being worn if it isn't, wait a minute, if it isn't being warned or carried. And then from then on, you know, uh, at fifth level, it's 2d10, and so on and so on. I like the spell because it does fire damage. That's one. And two, it just has a better range. So it's one of those things like as a wizard, in certain situations, you're really going to want to be laying back against certain uh, creatures you're fighting. And so it gives you the option of, you know, pegging things that are really far away. Like sometimes, you know, the, D the DM will, will say you're, you're up on a hill and you see an orc or whatever camp below and you snuck up on it. Um, the most uh, fighters and other characters who bust out their crossbows or their bows are going to be shooting at long range at that point. You're not. <laughs> you're just like ping so that's what i like about this spell um i i see where greg's coming from on the toll of the dead but like i said i i like this spell for the damage for more of the versatile all right greg i don't think range is as important you, you rarely fight at 120 feet you're usually within like 40 feet most of the time yeah it depends on the campaign and what you're doing yeah. I mean, but... I, know, I know the game is called Dungeons and Dragons for a reason, so <laughs> there's that. Yeah, if you're outside a lot, maybe it's better, but I mean, it does, also doesn't, I don't think it scales up as well. Yeah, because you're just scaling up D10s rather than D12s. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. Yeah. But if they. Um... That's kind of annoying, though, that you could. That flammable objects really catch, catch fire if they're not being worn or carried. Mm -hmm. I could, like, carry an open bucket of gasoline, and if you hit it, well, I'm carrying it, it won't explode. Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> yeah, that would, that's just, you know what, you know what I think, because, like you were saying, because it's a cantrip, they are trying to limit on um, the effectiveness. Otherwise, every time you hit something with that, the player's going to be like, what are they wearing? And you'll be like, leather armor. Does it catch on fire? And then you have to make another roll, and then well, you have to keep, and, and then you have to keep track of that. You know, they're just like, you know what? We're not, we're not, we're not going there. What's he wearing? Armor made out of match heads. <laughs> nope. <laughs> but the the other effect is too. You can set things on fire. Great, the arsonist. You can set buildings on fire. You can set w other things like, you know, wooden boats on fire. You know, so th there's other applications that you can do. Not that I encourage your players sure. to be going around setting taverns on fire. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Because you, you don't do that. You shouldn't be setting taverns on fire. What, what if you bought the other tavern in town and then you set the other one on fire? <laughs> so you like, better make sure no one sees you. You drive all the business to your tavern now. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> See, and then 120 feet now, you could be hiding somewhere, casting fire bolts every turn on different parts of the uh, inn until it completely goes up in a blaze. So, yeah. yeah. So that that's our top 10 list, people. Um Hope you enjoyed the video. If you're new to the channel, hit the like button, leave a comment below. Tell us what your um your top ten would be. If you agree with any of these, what would you take out and put in and at what number? I'd like to hear that. So Greg, um what are your three opening uh cantrips? Uh, we're dead. One of the light spells. Well, Dancing lights are light. And then probably prestidigitation. 
I would think. Yeah. That's what I'd go with. Yeah. Uh, for me, like I said, I'm definitely taking number one, uh, Firebolt. Uh, number two, I would most likely take Dancing Light, even though I'm just used to taking light to have a light source. And then number three, depending on what kind of mage I was building, um, if I'm going to be more offensive, I would take uh, Tone of Toll of the Dead, or I would take Minor Illusion. Yeah, I don't think there's a reason to take two damage dealing cantrips. No. Only take one. Just only take one, I think. Yeah. So, there you have it. Only take one damage, people. Unless one's like a short range poison and the other yeah, one's a longer there's range. Other, like I said, there's other cantrips. So, you could take like a shocking grasp, you can take a chill touch. I think chill touch is one of them. Like, there's some it. other. No, shocking grasp is first level. I think it's chill touch that's first. That's a cantrip. And, you know, there are some things that you can just take to have it that way. But you, you really, you want, you want one of the light spells, either light or dancing light. You want one attack damage spell, like you said, and then you want a utility spell. And that makes a well-rounded uh, wizard. And then from there, you just keep, you just do whatever you want. Also remember that if you get a familiar, you can cast these spells from your familiar. There's that too. And that's another video. So, All right, people. What? Yeah. So like those grasps, cantrips, they're pretty useless on the wizard because you don't want to be anywhere close to combat. But through your uh, familiar, they can be useful. Yep. Through your through your cat Tuki, until he gets fireballed. And with that, that's another st another story for another day. Uh, we will catch you next video. Yeah, everyone.